Hello, everybody, and good evening. Um, and welcome to the first Walkley Media Talks for 2013 here at The Edge. Uh, I, my name is Anna Magnus. I'm from the Walkley Foundation and the Media, Entertainment and Arts Alliance. Uh, and I would like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which we are meeting, the elders of the Jaraga and Turbal peoples. I am delighted to welcome such a high calibre of panel speakers, speakers for tonight's event, and I'm pleased that the Brisbane community once again has shown interest and engagement with journalism. They will be coming out shortly. The 2013 the 2013, I should say, media, Walkley Media Talk series in Brisbane is hosted by Citizen J, which aims to equip everyday people with the skills to become credible citizen journalists through free workshops, a community newsroom, equipment for loan, goodness, one-on-one -on -one support, dedicated publishing platform, and most importantly, connections to the mainstream media. I'd like to thank those involved in the Citizen J program, The Edge, and the State Library of Queensland for allowing us to showcase these events, which are all part of the Walkley Awards broader program of community engagement. We kicked off the media talks last year and they have proven to be a great success. Tonight's talk promises to be no different as it poses a very provocative question. Can you really trust a journalist? Recent research has found journalists still languishing in the near bottom of the pile of the most trusted professionals, faring only marginally better than state and federal MPs, insurance brokers and real estate agents and, yes, used car salesmen. Where has the erosion of trust gone in our media? Where has it gone and is it getting worse? I'd like to welcome our panel of journalists, if they'd like to come out of the room, eventually they will, um, to what promises to be a lively discussion. Uh, we will have Steve Austin, uh, presenter from 612 ABC. We will also have a crikey senior journalist, Andrew Crook, Walkley award-winning feature writer of the Weekend Australian, Trent Dalton, and Green Left Weekly activist journalist, Ewan Saunders. But before I go, I would like to uh, welcome you to uh, I would like to welcome Ursula Skinnerman from the Citizen J program, who is the newsroom coordinator, to say a few words as well. Thank you, Anna. I'll just give our panellists a moment to get seated. Firstly, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land, the Turrbal people and the Yuggera people, and pay respects to their ancestors who came before them. Also, I'd like to acknowledge Mr Tim Fairfax, AM, whose generous support through the Queensland Library Foundation has made this program, the Citizen J program, possible, the Walkley Foundation and the Media Entertainment and Arts Alliance. Our speakers. Steve Austin, first up here. Steve Austin presents the morning show on ABC Radio 612. He's had a very long career with the ABC, including producing the 7.30 report and Stateline. Long, long ago, Steve started in community radio for Triple Z, and I know there are a few for Triple Z volunteers in the audience here today. Second, Trent Dalton. Trent Dalton is a Walkley Award-winning journalist. He writes for The Weekend Australian currently. He was Featured Journalist of the Year uh, in the National News Awards. Author, former assistant of the Courier Mail and named Queensland Journalist of the Year in 2011. Who's next? Yeah, Andrew. <laughs> I've only met Andrew and you in today. So <laughs> Getting the hang of it. Andrew Cook is a senior journalist for Crikey. He's based in Melbourne. Um, thank you very much for coming up to be part of uh, the Walkley Talks tonight. Uh, Andrew covers politics, the media, anything else that lands on his desk. Um, he's previously reported for the Business Spectacular and continues to report spectator, on music. Spectator. Spectacular. The Spectacular Spectator. <laughs> <laughs> uh, continues to report on music for the Vine. And lastly, we have Ewan Saunders, who has been reporting for and distributing Green Left Weekly since 2000. His, uh, his work is grassroots activist journalism. 
uh, activist journalism being reporting from the front lines and um, proudly uh, coming from a, a particular perspective. Now, I guess you want to know a little bit about Citizen J and, and why I'm in front of you. Uh, the, the Citizen J program is hosting the Walkley Media Talks here at The Edge. Citizen J is a citizen journalism program. It's a year-long project funded by Tim Fairfax AM through the Queensland Library Foundation. It's for citizen journalists to connect with each other, to get published, to have connections to mainstream media. As part of this last week, we launched our dedicated publishing platform, the website that you see on the screen at the moment. Most of the work up there is citizen journalists. They're not just citizen journalists who publish whatever they like. We don't print anything they like. We have a very strong set of contributor rules that basically brings a citizen journalist into the same realm of professionalism as a professional mainstream journalist. So you need to balance your stories. You need to provide your sources in the stories. Uh, you need to caption your photographs correctly. Uh, all of these kind of rules, law and ethics, the Media Alliance Code of Ethics is actually part of our contributor rules, thanks to the Media Entertainment and Arts Alliance um, having discussions with them. So that's really great to know that citizen journalists can operate under the Media Alliance Code of Ethics. We also encourage our contributors to be members of the MEAA, so that if there are ever any issues with their stories, you know as a member of the public or a member of the mainstream media that you can go to the MEAA and, and make a complaint. Uh, we also have a range of support for our contributors. So this includes a series of six workshops. Workshops coming, uh, everything from what is citizen journalism and why be a citizen journalist to how do you go out and find news? How do you create a, a succinct, beautiful story that people want to read? photojournalism, multimedia journalism, all of these things are, are covered in our workshops. We have, once people sign up, they have access to a contributor toolbox and that has a whole range of quick guides for people, media law and ethics guides, guides to your rights as a citizen journalist or a citizen photojournalist, how to use the equipment. Upstairs we have the community newsroom. It's a dedicated space for citizen journalists and people who already volunteer with community news organisations to come and make news. So we have equipment for hire and we have a space where people can create stories. And if you are in the mainstream media, all of the work that comes into Citizen J is Creative Commons licensed, so you can republish whenever you like, however you like. Uh, and we're hoping that through this program, mainstream media and guys like yourselves will keep a watching brief on the project and the content that comes in um, once in a while, republish something and maybe even get hold of, of some of our citizen journalists if they become eyewitnesses to something or, or if they just really have that voice that works for your publication. We have a couple of other streams, obviously the Walkley Talks is another stream of the Citizen J project. And the third part is the Experiments Fund, where we have $30,000 for people who have innovative projects to either source, create, present content, content or distribute that content. At the moment, we have a uh, Experiments Fund recipient, Ben, who is working on a, I can't remember what he called it off the top of my head, a flying HD camera. It's essentially, and you guys will love this, it's essentially a quadcopter that you control with an iPhone or an iPad. It has an HD camera attached to it. So, for instance, I could have my iPad here zooming around the room, getting footage from a bird's eye view, and that could be either live broadcast or recorded. So it's very exciting. And we still have $20,000 up for grabs, and we'll be announcing applications open in a couple of weeks, so just stay tuned for that. I'll hand it over to Steve Austin. Thanks, Ursula. Uh, well, ladies and gentlemen, uh, I assume you're here because you have a set of values. Uh, and I'll explain more in just a moment, but my employer 
which is technically you, but is actually the ABC, has asked me just to point out that any views I express tonight are mine alone and not the ABC's. <laughs> so just bear that in mind. Look, thanks to uh, Walkley Talks. Uh, the, uh, the Walkley uh, Media Talks series uh, is an important one. Uh, well, thanks also to the Citizen J Project and The Edge and to the Walkley Foundation through the MEAA. I suspect I've been set up uh, by certain friends in the MEAA because I spat the dummy a couple of months ago and quit the MEAA. And for me, the straw that broke the camel's back was Julian Assange uh, when, it was when he was announced as being a journalist. Now, Julian, in my mind, is a lot of things, uh, but I'm hoping to draw out for you tonight what I think is a difference between a journalist, a publisher, uh, or something, you know, a voyeur, or a spreader of gossip, or a very brave man who spreads military industrial secrets through dip diplomatic papers. The point is, what I hope for tonight is that you'll be able to decide for yourself. Because ultimately in the democratic process through Australian media, what I think we try and do is help you decide. Now that may not necessarily be the case for my, uh, for my other guests here. They've been introduced so I won't go through uh, much more detail. We are broadcasting this tonight on the web. It's being filmed uh, and it will be available to view tomorrow. Uh, so just bear in mind there will be time for questions later on this evening, uh, but just ask, bear in mind it is being broadcast. So uh, often public events can uh, be a lot of fun. We ask you to choose your words carefully, as any good citizen journalist would do. We're also uh, available to take questions via the web through the hashtag Walkley Talks. Uh, so Citizen Jay have kindly given me a, a, an Apple iPad, which I look forward to taking home. And, uh, and uh, so if you want a question asked of the panellists, please say. The ABC takes journalism very seriously, storytelling very seriously. And last year, uh, a range of broadcasters were taken down to Sydney for what's called the Local Radio Awards, and I was one of the bunnies who went down. And they sit you there with a range of very good journalists, people who are much better than I am, and on one of the panel discussions, not much like this, it was a room full of uh, radio people from all around Australia. They had the big name ABC people on the panel up here and they had a top line uh, journalist from one of the big current affairs programs who's also a Walkley and Warner Ritter a couple of times over. And she said, look, there's no such thing as truth. There's only your truth. Uh, I'd like to test that. I think you can test that. And the simple way is doing what science often does and that's invert it. Test it and see if you think there's no such thing as lies. So I'm hoping that tonight's panel discussion will help you form your own view. So let me ask you, uh, first of all, to welcome our panellists. Give them a decent round of applause. They've already been introduced, please. <laughs> all right, Andrew, crikey, I need to give a declaration that I'm a subscriber to Crikey, uh, which I think is a terrific uh, online publication, and I use it. I think it's different and it's reliable, but in my mind it has some differences to other forms of media. So, Andrew, first of all, do you think we need to regain the public's trust? It implies we've lost something. Absolutely. Um, you see the disengagement every day. This is why outlets like Crikey are gaining more prominence. Um, I think you get into dangerous territory when the reliability that Steve talks about um, starts to dissipate uh, and you look at uh, blogs and sort of random sources that don't, you know, they're not subject to an MEAA code, they're not subject to any accountability, they will never get rolled on Media Watch, for example. Um, and you look at some of the stuff with, that was happening with the Prime Minister recently, and a lot of that was being driven by blogs that were unaccountable. And uh, Phil Curry, the Australian Financial Review, formerly of the Sydney Morning Herald journalist, went on late line and he said, the difference is I can't just write stuff, you know, I need to test it, I need to ring people uh, and that's what informs my reports. I'm not, and that's why I'm accountable. So, um, you know, there is a, a hunger for alternative media sources and it's nice of Steve to, to mention Crikey and... Um, Do you have an editorial guide and also editorial policies or is it... Whatever you can get by. We do, we do. We uh, subscribe to the to the, to the MEAA guidelines, but we also have our own editorial policies and we also have our own guidelines up on the Crikey website. So, Are they uniquely different in any way from any particular way? 
Uh, we got uh, Margaret Simons, a leading journalism academic and our former media writer, uh, who's now at the University of Melbourne, to come in and draft those. And okay. um, she conducted some workshops, and they were sort of the process of internal discussion and also reference to the external okay. uh, codes that are out there already. So, yeah. so do you think we need to regain public trust in the media? For the, oh, sorry, does, do we need to rebuild public trust in the media for Australians? Do we, have we lost it? We need to rebuild it. One, one crikey story at a time, Steve. Okay. <laughs> Ewan, Green Left Weekly, has a good online site and uh, a print version that uh, can be purchased around, uh, around town. What about yourself? Have we lost uh, sort of the public's trust? Is it sort of an implied uh, stance, if you like, in my mind, in Green Left Weekly, that we have lost something in the media? And that's partly why Green Left Weekly exists for you, I think. It, it's a tough question for me to answer because I, I, I can't remember ever having faith in the mainstream media personally. <laughs> but um, <laughs> um, I, I, I think if uh, it does depend on what media you're talking about, and I, I, I don't necessarily think it's the right question to be asking because the the way the mainstream media develops and its trajectory is is, is not changing um, in in terms of. Do I trust the media? Do I trust what they have to say? Uh, I think the question is answered by who owns what media, and and and, it, and that should always be the question of of, of the reader and the viewer. Uh, and and if you want to delve a bit deeper, whose interest does that media represent? So it's not so much. So you think money is playing a big factor in terms of of the Australian media scene? Um, I, th I think ownership and uh, yeah, and then the political interest and the sectional interest of ownership and and money, of course, the sponsors and so on, the advertisers. But uh, if 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 you want people to trust the media more, my answer to them would be uh, to to look harder and deeper and elsewhere because uh, you're not going to find. Uh, what you're looking for, if you're looking for truth and objectivity, at, at, at you're going to find that in, at places like Crikey, I think, and, and far less so in uh, the, the vast media empires that, that dominate um, news in, in three continents, at least. Trent, let me come to you. You work for a man who's often uh, raised as a person who is uh, the cause of distorted news. You've worked for The Courier, and now you're working at Australian Weekend magazine. Can you be trusted? <laughs> You're talking about Rupert Murdoch, not Chris, <laughs> not, not Chris Mitchell. Yeah. It's an interesting yeah. question. Um, it, just to give you an idea, uh, from a grunt reporter perspective, um, I've worked 13 years for News Limited, um, and my life is a daily um, uh, challenge to convince people that I'm trying to do a decent story. And... Uh, I told Steve this story on radio um, the other day. My wife and I went to our obstetrician six years ago and it was like the happiest day of my life. I'd just seen my, my kid, you know, in this, in this beautiful x-ray and, and, uh, and then we go out to the lady on the, the front desk and she, she looks at my occupation on, our, on the forms we uh, filled out and she goes, ah, a journalist. And she said, you're not one of those scumbag journalists, are you? <laughs> and I thought, wow, what an interesting, um, you know, point of view because she just came right out and said it. And, uh, and I thought, well... You know, and then and then you read these polls where you know, um, you know, we're placed alongside the likes of I don't know lawyers or um, car salesmen, and, and that's another interesting point because I have a very good friend who's a car salesman on on the Maruka Magic Mile, <laughs> and uh, he babysits my kids sometimes. So um, you know, and I put my trust in him. But then, you know, when I saw that lady say that to me, I always start thinking about you know when we when we talk about this, and I do find myself talking about this type of thing all the time at dinner parties because that is definite definitely a re reality out there that people have you know I guess over the course of a of you know how many years a newspaper and media has existed has has perhaps lost faith in in journalism and I, I really try and flip that conversation sometimes whenever I'm and I, and I actually hope all of us do it all us journos do it occasionally and try and sort of stick up for some of the great journos who are out there you know so I always talk about you know, my heroes, the reason I got into feature writing, like Cameron Stewart and, and Headley Thomas and uh, Tony Kosh, and I talk about, you know, Colleen Egan busting out a guy who was wrongfully imprisoned in Perth, you know, and uh, and all these incredible journalists. And before them, C.W. Bean. And, and, you know, if we sort of go too far on um, bagging ourselves, you know, we forget the wonderful role that journalists play in 21st century society. Andrew and Ewan, do people regale you? Do you actually tell them you're a journalist? Do you reveal that or is it... Do you get a wall of 
Well, you have to on the phone when you when you ring them, or else you you'd be <laughs> in contravention of the guidelines. But um, <laughs> you know, sometimes the public interest. Sometimes you can get away with you know, saying, you know, I'm not a journalist. I oh, will not even mentioning it. Um, you know, public if, it, if it's justified. But normally, yes, I do identify myself as a journalist on the phone. Um, I do get um, grief f uh, f for it sometimes um, late at night uh, when all the sort of uh, river of pathos seems to sort of boil over. And uh, yeah, absolutely. You and you tell people you're a journalist. Um, it depends on who I'm talking to, to be honest. <laughs> uh, and and, and, and yep. that, that's not a sneaky answer, it's just a, a reflection of the kind of journalism that I do, which is, is most of the time very locally based and uh, often with yep. people I know and yes. work with in, uh, in, like I said, the various social movements. But when I am doing a bigger story, yes, of course, I, I, I tell people where I'm from and, and what I'm doing. Mm. Let me, I want to rephrase the question slightly. What went wrong? What went wrong? I remember seeing all the president's men. Remember the movie that sort of was about the uh, the, uh, the the um, the pen oh, not, sorry the removal of Richard Nixon, the impeachment of Richard Nixon, and uh, uh, and it was a great movie in the seventies. And I saw that and thought, wow, that's what journalism can do. It can stand up for what's right and good and expose injustice and political corruption and unfair play and politics. And it was that that movie was a big motivator for me. What went wrong? People used to love journalists. I, I think it's hard to separate journalism from the rest, from, from say, maybe sort of a faith in liberal democracy. You know, uh, ironically, the, um, the Watergate unveiled this sort of hole at the middle of the US government, and you had declining public trust levels. And I think when you have declining trust in public institutions, journalism, as uh, you know, its role as the fourth estate, also goes down with it. So it's very hard to sort of just disaggregate journalism and say, you know, uh, we, 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 we don't trust... A lot of people just don't trust you know, the system or what they perceive to be uh, the, the liberal democracy as it currently stands, so... Yeah. Trent? I, Ewan? Trent. I, I really contend that, you know, there, there still are the Woodward and Bernstein still out there, you know, and, and perhaps... I, don't, I hate to be, like, Mr Positive, but um, it's, um, you know, there are amazing journos doing amazing things. I see it every day, and uh, they're, they're doing that kind of, you know, the meeting in the, um, the underground car park, and they're, they're doing that at night, and they're... You know, Matt Condon has just released a book, um, you know, all about, you know, uncovering what went on in the joke, you know, and, uh, and he spent three years doing that. And he's got, a, he's got two kids, he's got a baby on the way, and you know what he's been doing every weeknight for the, for the past three years? He's been sitting at Terry Lewis's house. So, you know, that's commitment, you know, it's dedication, <laughs> and, uh, you know, um, it's, um, you know it's, um, it's an interesting thing, and, I'd, you know, I'd love to see... I'd love to see the great William Goldman, great screenwriter, write another All, All the President's Men, and uh, I'm sure, you know, we need some screenwriters out there in, in Australia, <laughs> perhaps, talking about some of the amazing Four Corners pieces or some of the amazing, um, you know, Seven Thirty Report pieces, some of them, you know, incredible work these guys do and the incredible work, you know, done on, on, on our newspaper. Right. And, uh, yeah, I, I just think they're, it's still out there and, and that's the big thing about this trust issue that we need to overcome. I don't know how you do that. You and uh, what, what do you think? What went wrong? I think Green Left Weekly has a particular view on this, which is partly why you exist, isn't it? Well, I, I think what went wrong is uh, can be linked up with what's going wrong more broadly. Uh, in historical terms, I think the, the rise of neoliberalism as a as a political ideology, and uh, you know, with Margaret Thatcher, Ronald Reagan, and so on, and the the uh, that that ideology has crept its way into journalism in the form of like severe cost cutting and and, and outsourcing of journalists and what we have now is uh, the the mainstream journalism we're exposed to now is is cheap journalism it, it doesn't cost much and and by and large the kind of um, you know exhaustive investigative journalism that that um, all the president's men is about and uh, and the I think the ABC is known for, and you know, even the Curry Mail way back when, um, Phil Dickey and so on, that kind of journalism uh, is, is getting harder to find because it costs too much. So that's one side of it. I think the other side of it is the, uh, the concentration of media ownership and, uh, and the growth of media empires and their... Uh, they're very open and, uh, and public now, uh, particularly with Murdoch, uh, influence on democracies. Um, uh, so I, I, I think with, with, with the trivialisation uh, of, of uh, politics um, being thrown in our face every day and the... Politics as sport or soap opera. Exactly. I mean, I mean, news news is nothing if not trivial uh, by and large these days. What's presented to us, and, and that leaves out so much. Now, Andrew, 
didn't, wasn't it the case when sort of many in the 80s, globalisation, you know, companies to survive were told, you know, their strategy, their corporate strategy was get big or die. Mm. Uh, and the successful companies did that. The ones that are still around did that. And that's actually companies like News and others. Do you think that that actually globalisation, the scramble to, you know, get big, if you don't get big economically, you'll be crushed by someone else from another continent? Do you think that was a big driver? Well, I mean, it's interesting that you mention News Limited because, you know, they, they got big, but they didn't get big on, on journalism. And you, you um, see now they invested in journalism, but you see now the vast majority of their revenues come from, you know, producing films and cable television. So, I've, um, and, you know, a Fairfax might be another example, you know, was was big, really struggling, really struggling now. So it's sort of like um, the logic uh, is, is really chafing there with, with journalism. And even if you take something like Crikey, I mean, a newspaper uh, now has, you know, a newspaper might have 80, 80 journalists, 100 journalists. Crikey has sort of three journalists, you know, and, and we, we, if we're trying to assume the mantle for that type of long-form investigative reporting, the sort of reporting where you can go out and bid wrong and not get the story after two weeks, it, it's, it's very difficult. It's a you, resource issue. You don't think Rupert Murdoch actually saved a lot of jobs uh, in the UK and in Australia? It's well, not you know, at Wapping. You know, ink runs through his veins. Mm. He's a newspaper man through and through, and there are many who would argue that, uh, yes, he rationalised corporately, but he actually, the alternative was corporate oblivion. In other words, there are many who would argue he actually saved a lot of journalists' jobs. Oh, yeah, maybe, maybe on one, one level. I mean, he bought papers um, yeah, and, and papers that... And that made them efficient? Made them efficient, or, or, or in the case of the New York Post, um, made them, you know, lose money. And um, in the case of the Australian... Uh, lose money. So um, I, I, I don't think, I think Rupert is a, is a good businessman. Uh, it's a very successful company. Uh, the share price is going very well and, you know, I'd love to have news limited shares in my superannuation portfolio, <laughs> but it doesn't, doesn't mean that, uh, doesn't mean that the, the journalism is necessarily just thriving there, even though they have many more resources than Crikey, for example. Trent, um, I think uh, the Australian, I think Rupert Murdoch funded the Australian. He ran it at a loss for 25 years before it turned to profit. That would indicate a commitment to journalism in my mind. What do you, you, you work there? Yeah, well, absolutely. And, um, and you know, I'll tell you my perspective. Um, my past five stories I've done for the Weekend Australian magazine. Um, I've done a story where they flew me to, just finished a story where they flew me to Sydney to spend five days in Lakemba doing a, a proper insight into Muslim Australia. Um, before that, I went to Romania to do a story on animal welfare. Um, after that, we, I, well, sometime before that, I went to Mackay to do a story on native title. Um, you know, all of these things cost money. And, um, you know, and, and to me, uh, I, I get paid to do this stuff. And, uh, and, and I try and do it in the best way I can. And I try and do it, bec I, I do it and I love doing it because I think somewhere in the back of my mind, I'm, tr I'm making some small difference. And, uh, and yeah, the person who's, who's paying for all that is Rupert Murdoch. And, um, and, and you know, I mean, I can't sit here and, and speak on behalf of a massive organisation, but my personal perspective is that for 13 years, I've rocked into Bowen Hills um, offices. I grab a coffee and I say hi to my um, friends and colleagues who I respect very much. And we all do the same thing. We sit down at our desks and we try to break news. I try and grab a cracking yarn cracking story and it's all about storytelling and and yeah I think this this company or my company invests extremely heavily in people telling stories. So when you have an editorial meeting and I'll work my way back across the panel now when you have an editorial meeting does the editor sit down and say mate I'm going to send you into Lakemba I want you to reveal what those burqa clad immigrants are doing. I Go hard. A, I have a wonderful editor named Christine Midap who um, is amazing in terms of her ability to to um, let a journalist be free and write the story that presents itself. Mm -hmm. And uh, as part of this story, I, I managed to get hold of this um, uh, Muslim cleric um, who's doing a particularly great sort of, you know, some, some great work in Lakemba and, uh, and, you know, but he's very media cautious because he doesn't trust the media. And, uh, and, and he <laughs> we had this most amazing chat, spent a day with him walking around Lakemba and at the end we shook hands and he said, you're still not going to write a, a fair story. And I said, mate, I'll just write what I see. And, uh, and I'll try and write that in the most balanced way. And, 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 and that's exactly what my editor does in terms of my role on, on news. And, uh, and that's, it's, the, it's trying to get me a ripping story, write the hell out of it. And if it's, if it's crap, you're gonna get it thrown back in your face. But 
you know, and it better be balanced. You know, the last news piece I wrote got sent back to me because it wasn't balanced enough. I mean, that I'm just sort of speaking from my perspective, and and uh, and and definitely a, a feature piece. It'll come back with the dreaded yellow highlight, and and you'll have a thousand words where you have to change it and and make that story more balanced or more insightful. And uh, yeah, but that's just my perspective. That's Trent Dalton from the Week in Australian Magazine. Andrew Crook, I interviewed you a couple of weeks ago about electoral funding. Who was donating to who in the political parties? When you have your editorial meeting at Crikey, they say, mate, I want you to go down and work hard on the Conservatives and see which health companies have been donating to them because I know they're going to privatise in, in Queensland. Have a look at the big gaming houses from Asia as well. Do you get writing instructions, go these guys, go these guys? Oh, I mean, we have a co more a collaborative approach, really. I mean, we, we don't have many people sitting around the table. Um, it's, sometimes it's very obvious what the crikey angle is on things. I mean, yep. th that political donation down I've been writing for, I think, five years in a row, and it's a kind of the same every year, but it's a necessary story to write. Um, and we know what our audience likes, and, and we, we can pick off angles like that. Um, but we don't, yeah, we don't have the traditional sort of heft and resources. Like, I mean, I, I would struggle to say to my editor, look, I'm going to spend three weeks... Um, in Lakemba, um, mm. they can say, well, you know, that's sort of, you know, 15 editions of Crikey that you're not filing for, and what are we paying you for? And oh, I'll kind of have a great feature, and you'll be like, well, no one will read it anyway, it'll be behind the paywall. So, you know, there are these sort of, they're these sort of pressures. <laughs> yeah. 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 Ewan, what about a Green Left Weekly? What's the editorial process? Do you get writing instructions? Uh, we will get requests from the editorial team, which, by the way, is tiny and poorly paid. Um, Green Left operates on a, a, a national fighting fund, annual fighting fund of about $250,000 a year. Which, uh, does that come from unions or does that come from uh, political parties? That, or? that comes purely from the donations of supporters, okay. as we don't have any commercial advertising. Um, so it's almost philanthropic in its, in its uh, donations? Uh, yeah, very much so. It's a, I mean, it's a, it's a labour of love for uh, the people who write for Green Left Weekly, so editorially uh, it, it, it is a grassroots newspaper and the stories come from the grassroots and uh, 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 however in terms of um, you know what's going to be on the cover and so on this week um, mm -hmm. we will get requests from the editorial team it is <laughs> in interesting though that, that we raise the issue of um, uh, the coverage of Muslims and, and, and the topic of Islam in this country because Green Left Weekly did get a scoop last year when one of our uh, activists slash journalists was uh, was nearby at the uh, near, nearby the demonstration against the the anti-Islam film that came out, and all across the mainstream press, it was reported as Muslims attacking police and, uh, and, and violent Islamic demonstrators. Um, Green Left Weekly was the only outlet in the country that was there and reported what actually happened, which was a peaceful demonstration which grew agitated when it was kettled or surrounded by police. Uh, this was before the news cameras got there, so um, I, I think I'm not sure if that's on the on the questions tonight. But uh, the, the so there's no, no editorial. You're not given editorial writing instructions as such. You know, go this mob, go that group. Not no, no. We 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 are everywhere. I guess as journalists, where people are in motion, as activists, that's where we want to be, and uh, and we report on what, what what's happening where people are moving on a grassroots level. Mm. If you're listening online, my name's Steve Austin and this is part of the Walkley Talk series at Citizen J at the Edge at South Bank in Brisbane. I'm a retired policeman. Uh, I have a bit of a mortgage left. I've still got a, a wife and a couple of kids. She hasn't left me because of the appalling hours I work. And I've worked out that I can actually make good money as a private investigator. And I've got a mate and he's got a digital scanner and we know how to use it. An amazing thing happened. I accidentally logged onto Campbell Newman's mobile phone. And I downloaded a conversation. Now, I can't tell you how I got it, but a conversation that Campbell Newman intends to privatise the Royal Brisbane Hospital and the contracts tenders won't be publicly released and we know that Ramsey Health, a big donor to the Liberal Party in New South Wales, will win the project. And I've got the audio to show you. Andrew Crook from Crikey, do you use it? So you're talking about hacking voicemails, are you, Steve? Yes. <laughs> um, well, I don't know. It depends if you delete them, maybe. Uh, look, I think um, I think the 
the yes, no, absolutely. Public interest. I'm a reliable if, if, source. I'm if, an experienced police if, officer. If, if, I can if, play you the audio. If the premier is secretly privatising a, a public asset, then that is definitely in the public interest, and that should be broadcast far and wide, immediately, if possible. So um, you know that they've donated. You've done the story they've about the political donations. Absolutely. You join the dots. You mm -hmm. know, and it's it's it's, a, it's a easy. You know, follow the money, as they say, and that, mm -hmm. that's a, that is an easy that is an easy one. I don't think that's ethically challenged at all. Mm -hmm. um, if it's if it's in the public interest, public interest overrides. The, um, the commerce. I'm not sure if it is voicemail hacking because maybe they, we can't say that, but uh, overrides the ob ob obtaining the, the Well, voice. I can't say too much. No, no. <laughs> Ewan, do you use it? Yes. Um, I, I mean, <laughs> in short, uh, we'd be very excited to receive information like that at Green Left <laughs> Weekly. Um, I mean, we, there are, uh, of course, legal ramifications and, you know, stuff like that needs to be vetted by our legal team. But, uh, mm -hmm. um, Public interest, absolutely, and uh, okay. I, I'd say you're probably not too far off the book, off the uh, mark there. Uh, give it a give it a few <laughs> months there, Steve. <laughs> Trent, do you use it? Yeah, I'll probably share the similar um, yeah sentiments of the fellas here. Um, mm -hmm. um, uh, my first move would definitely be though to straight to the editor. That's okay. way too complicated for me. You know. <laughs> yeah. All right, now you're my gun feature writer, so <laughs> I've put you on the story. You write the story, it goes bang. People are outraged. Yeah. Talk back on the ABC is going off. Uh, the first thing Ramsey does and says is there's no link between our political donations to uh, the political party and the tender process. We have no involvement. We're not the government. have to ask the government. I'm Campbell Newman, and I say, I am sick of this. I'm going to sue. I take you to court, and in what's called the discovery process, my lawyer, who's a pretty damn good lawyer, says, so, Andrew Crook, reveal your source, please. Go to jail. Um, you, you, just, you just can't. You can't reveal your source. I mean, it, it, uh, it, you're a young man. The beginning of your career. No, I mean that's just a, a cardinal, a cardinal sin, sin of journalists. And and when it does happen, it, it's very reluctantly. You, you see, Cameron, Cameron Stewart. Um, you know, there was a waiver involved uh, in Victoria recently. Um, you know, with with the the policeman down. I don't know if people are following this, but but yeah, I mean, he was under a lot of pressure, and um, and a waiver was signed. That was the only way that he could say who the source source was, and it was um, it was heart, you know heart wrenching. And he was in court. It was kind of terrible, t t terrible to watch. Ewan, I take you to court. I say, reveal your source. Do you? Uh, again, no, Steve. Uh, a a activists are kind of used to getting arrested. I, I guess. That, uh, <laughs> <laughs> Um, right. But, yeah, I, I echo Andrew there, of course not, of course not. I never, never reveal one source and mm -hmm. n n like b deal with the consequences. That's just a rule as far as I'm concerned. Trent, you've got young children. Yeah, that, that's... Rupert, um, Rupert flies you around from location to location. <laughs> you, you, you know the retired police officer is a bit of a slime anyhow. <laughs> you know, he, he, he would have sold it to anyone. <laughs> And, and you're going to have to tell your daughter, honey, I might do some time inside prison with those nasty tattooed men who want to make me their puppy. <laughs> <laughs> These are the thoughts I sometimes go to at night on, on my pillow. But, um, and you know, the heat I get from my wife sometimes, Steve, it's mm -hmm. horrendous. So I could only imagine the conversation that we would have when I come home that day and go, sweetie, I've got to go to prison. Mm. Um, but, uh, yeah, I would, I, would, I would say... No, and I'd, I'd okay. do my damnedest to, to withhold my sources, yeah. Inspired I, by people before me, you know, and, and maybe if I wasn't, you know what I mean, it'd be different if I was the first ever person to do that, but I've been, you know, there's, there is a great journalistic sort of fraternity in, in that regard, you know, mm. these noble people before us, and, and way even more than that, you know, people in the Middle East who have died for journalism, so mm, okay. a couple of years in prison, you know, someone bloody gets burned to death, you know, so. Okay. Does it vary with sort of the, the nature of the talent? There was a public interest in that story. But Lady Gaga comes to town. Trent Dalton's been put on over as a feature writer, and Andrew, you learn they're having an affair. And you, you've been, you're writing the gossip column in Crikey. Do you use it? If, if you've got it from the same, you know, you've got it from a, a, essentially a voicemail from someone else's mobile phone. Oh, I mean, that's, that's just a trashy, trashy story, Steve, that uh, would it never... It sells never. magazines, Andrew. It <laughs> sells. It generates income. Oh look, um, you know we're not we're not TMZ, but um, I, you know I think um, the interesting thing in the whole thing about voicemail hacking was that those sort of sites, the American sites, the TMZs, 
actually didn't know what the problem was. You know, there was ha it was happening in the UK, and they were like, "Well, we we hack voicemails all the time. We know what the putt code is. You know, we just enter it." And well, you know, there's a whole industry, a media industry around the world based on that, isn't there? That's yeah. right. And the, you know, they've got um, National Enquirer and those ones who would have no compunction of, about hacking of hacking voicemails. But um, you know, I think that's a that's a, it's a very kind of celebrity um, specific example. So n no. I all right, let me no. go to you. Okay, you and you know tr that Dalton fella. He's a hypocrite in a slime bag. <laughs> he works for Murdoch, for goodness sake. Uh, and, he, and he trashed Muslims in his feature piece. And, and, and you found out that he's actually shagging Lady Gaga <laughs> while, while pretending to be high and mighty. You know, married with kids. And you've got an option to let your friends know. There's a lot of fun and reward in telling people psychologically, I know something, you know, let me tell you this. Don't tell anyone, but... Do you use it? We don't have a gossip section yet, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, if we can increase our, in, increase our subscriber base uh, this evening. We might, we might <laughs> be getting there. But I, I, I think that points to a, a more serious problem, uh, which is not so much uh, what's what's hacked in phone calls and 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 what we might know, but what we do know and doesn't get published. Um, that, that to me is the big problem with uh, media in this country, that the big issues and, and the in your face issues, for example, the, the Gillard government supporting a regime in Sri Lanka to uh, send refugees back there or, or stop their boats before they get a chance to leave, that, uh, while this government's facing war crimes accusations, that's the scandal, not, not Lady Gaga. So why, why isn't that on the front page of The Australian? <laughs> All right. Now, that's, the setup is obvious. So let me ask you, since Finkelstein in London, uh, think, since the, the whole of the, the scandal that occurred over there where uh, the media's, sorry, the public's fears about the media were largely confirmed, did that change anything editorial in your organisations here in Australia? In other words, although it wasn't about Australia as such, the media, the media and journalists in this country were talking about it. Did anything change? Culture, discussion, uh, frame of reference change at all here? And I'll, I'll start with you, Trent, and I'll work back along again. Uh, we, uh, yeah, I mean, we have already always had a really strong, you know, everyone who gets a job at news, I remember it doing myself, myself when you start, you've got to do a go through a series of ethics um, training courses and things like that. I guess, if anything, it was ramped up. And, um, and, uh, and there was more of this notion that, kid, go to your editor and just bloody go to them and, and don't, you know, just don't get yourself in any sort of mess, you know. And I mean, in the ABC, I, they call that referring upwards, basically. Referring upwards. Cover your ass. Cover your ass, and it's the, it's, the, it's the smart way to proceed. And, um, and, and I, guess, I guess, if anything, all that... All that that stuff was really put under the microscope. And I mean, it was a full-scale, you know, look at, look at you know, how um, we work and, and mm. uh, you know, and, and everyone was up for it because no one wanted to, um, you know, I, gu I guess no one wanted to, to see that. Have a cream pie in their face on British television. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> on national maybe, television. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Andrew, anything changing, crikey? Oh, I mean, we're aware of it. We, we ratcheted up our um, columns uh, bagging news, news uh, corporation and, <laughs> and uh, we're very careful to make the distinction because um, mm -hmm. every time we did, you know, someone would be on the phone, probably someone from News Limited, uh, Limited Corporate Relations saying, you know, there is a difference, Andrew, between yes. News Corporation and, and News Limited. So I made that um, mistake, yes. Yes. <laughs> Um, but, but I think a lot of the criticism of, of news over that, inter interestingly enough, I think in the UK, it was uh, that argument about that the phone hacking was imported into Australia. Yes. And I, th I, th I thought it, it, it was a, a, an argument that didn't actually cut to the, to the real issue. People don't like News Limited for a lot of reasons, but, but the, the allegations of criminality didn't actually fly in, a, in Australia as far as, as far as I could tell. So, so News Limited manager were absolutely right in that regard, and it actually closed off a lot of the other broader criticism that probably, you know, Ewan would, 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 would make about corporate media, for example. What criticism would you make, Ewan? Regarding the phone hacking, specifically? Yes, yeah, or so did, did anything change in Green Left Weekly, or did this supercharge Green Left Weekly and sort of your reason for being, almost? Uh, whenever anything like that happens, and we we try to tell the world on our front covers, and uh, as, a, as a reason to uh, buy the alternative media, uh, mm -hmm. but... You know, no, no, nothing did change except for uh, probably the same thing that happened to Crikey, a, a flurry of uh, uh, critical articles uh, regarding uh, the Murdoch press. But um, 
Yeah, look, I, I, I think probably that sort of stuff has been happening for years to, uh, for different, to different degrees. You know? All right, well, I'm going to open up questions to the floor in just a moment, but in terms of media organisations, who do you trust, Ewan? Uh, oh, apart from my own, um, look, I, I think there is still good journalism, and, and I, uh, you, you can. Do you trust organisations or individual journalists and writers? Look, I don't trust organisations. Um, I, I, I still trust the ABC, and uh, I'm, I'm glad we've still got it. Uh, but uh, I think you know the, there is influence there from the you know the appointments to the board over the, through the Howard years and so on. Um, and but uh, yeah, I, I trust the ABC, um, and I, uh, to an extent, I, I can trust uh, some Fairfax publications. Um, but and you know, uh, even amongst the Murdoch stable. There are there are differences. The the Courier Mail is very different to the Australian, and mm -hmm. and uh, you do pick your favourite journalists on, on on your particular issues. But okay. no, as as organisations, certainly not. Andrew, who do you trust? Media wise. Oh, oh look, I mean, I, I trust you know most reporting because it, it, I'd sort of tend to take a less sort of systemic view of the ownership because it's obvious what the angle what the angle is. I'm not sure if media consumers in general think this, but if you read The Australian, for example, you know the biases, you know who the editor is, you know who the owner is, and I think you can pick through news stories and say, well, that's been put in for that reason, that's been put in for that reason. So I don't necessarily, it doesn't really preoccupy me. I'm happy to read, uh, I read all the papers and I can, I can get trustworthy information out of them if I know the, where the blind spots are. So, okay. Yeah. Trent, who do you trust? Yeah, I trust, um, absolutely trust all journalism. You know, I don't, I don't read stuff with a cynical view. And um, I, I try and believe that that journo's gone out and uh, and done the hard yards, and and I I have a fair idea that, that guy's probably guy or girl, sorry, um, has um, and amazing female journalists in Australia, um, but uh, has put their heart and soul into that piece, and uh, and um, you know I just I just try and uh, I don't know, yeah, just just really put my faith in in journalism, the whole concept, because it's you know what I got into, it's what I sort of believe in. All right, well, over to you, to the floor. Question is, do you believe them? Do they have your trust? You've already heard them say that under some circumstances, they will use private material that I think would probably be a clear breach of the Telecommunications Act uh, on matters that they say, in their opinion, are a matter of public interest. And on, they all say that they're pure as the driven snow when it comes to trashy celebrity gossip which must explain why there's no celebrity gossip magazines out there. Um, so do you trust them? Do you have a question for these journalists? We have a couple of microphones on the floor, so if you'd like to put your hand up, just give me your first name. Uh, if you have a question of these guys, now is the time. And don't be afraid. You've obviously come along because you're interested in it. Do you think the democratic process is damaged? Anyone? All right. Ursula from Citizen J, and then at the front table again. I'm happy to open up the floor. I wondered where do you think blame lies in terms of the public not trusting journalism and the media in general, whose fault is that? Is it the audience's fault? Is it individual journalists' fault? Is it the organisation's fault or what sort of proportion of each? Trent? Um, uh, it's, it's, it's probably um, an, an even split. I don't know. I, I mean, I certainly wouldn't blame the reader, I guess. I mean, you know, that, that yeah, I mean, they're, they're just consuming it, I guess, and um, and that's a job for all of us to, to work on. And, uh, you know, one thing I, I really feel, we we journos can feed it sometimes, you know, like I, I've, I've had conversations with, you know, at pubs and stuff, and we're, we're so sort of, we are pretty sort of negative, and, uh, you know, I, yeah, sometimes, you know, and, and I don't know, there's a whole new wave of, of um, this, well, you know what, there's so many media outlets now too, so there's so many forums for that, this topic to be dis discussed, and, uh, and you know, I, I, yeah, it's 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 everything, and maybe that's the power of, you know, where we are today in the 21st century in terms of everyone having their say, and and you know, and maybe that's all part of it too, that it just seems that way, and yeah, I don't know. I, I sort of, you know, on the, um, the the search for truth, I think sometimes people, which you know, is the essence of journalism, uh, pe pe the sort of failure of democracy or a failure of getting involved and getting involved in issues sometimes means that. Uh, that, that people don't even understand what the role of a journalist, a journalist is, you know, and, and, you know, journalists are offensive, you know, they're nosy, they operate at the limits of the law and of ethics and, you know, they, they're having a crack 
and I think uh, maybe a sort of the collapse in trust in, um, in liberal democratic societies has actually contributed to that, you know, um, that, that it's just a, a misunderstanding of, 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 of journalists and what they do. Ewan? Uh, I, I was thinking about this before the event and I, I'm going to have to blame the government, uh, surprisingly. <laughs> but I, I, I don't think it's a question of blame when it's a, it, it, this is a behemoth that, that's moving in a certain direction and it's not stopping uh, any time soon. And the, a lot of the, the problems with uh, you know, big mainstream journalism are, are, are cultural problems that, again, are, are all link, interlinked with, with questions of ownership and... Uh, you know, political perspective of those owners and so on. So uh, I think, uh, as with most things in our society, the government does have a role to play. And I look to an example that I've studied a bit, which is Venezuela, where the government uh, is pouring millions upon millions of dollars into uh, funding for community media. And what we're seeing there is an explosion in, in community media, independent community media that can access funding to uh, buy the equipment to to uh, to run the programs to do the investigations and so on and uh, honestly I think that's where where the answer lies in hasn't Hugo Chavez also jailed a lot of journalists uh, no that's a myth uh, but uh, it, it, it yeah it, it, if you uh, investigate a lot of those claims it's no, they're not actually true the, okay. uh, the Venezuelan media okay. is one of the freest in the world in fact the um, the, the huge uh, stable of private media organisations over there are rapidly anti-government um, and indeed collaborated in the 2002 coup, uh, which is also on the record. But um, no, I think reporting of certain international situations, countries, regimes like that, uh, you, that's one area where you do have to look for alternative okay. sources. Mm. Madam, if you could just state your first name, please, and ask a question of a specific journalist, go for your life. My name is Patricia, and it's actually for all three of you as I was listening. Uh, over and over again, as a, just a very normal, average person, it's hard. You're all associated with a particular institution, and regardless, uh, I don't trust any of the institutions, more or less. I do trust individuals. So how if you're just the general person reading, how do you determine which individuals to follow? So you all sound, as you said, very trustworthy. I listen to Richard Feidler. I do listen to you occasionally, Steve. None of you I know, nothing personal, because, for instance, with the Australian, it's too hard to filter through what is and what is not. And as you commented, the gentleman in the center. Andrew. Mm -hmm. Andrew. You're aware of all of these. You can read all of these articles, and you know where the blind spots are. I, I don't. I too have to make a living in my preferred occupation. I too have to pursue all of these other things. So your Eating. question is, how does a member of the public know who to which journalist to how? trust? There is no quote unquote compare.com, not that I'm a you know, I'm a yep. proponent of that, but there's nothing out there that I know of that actually allows us to identify what's trustworthy. Can I th ask Trent to start that first? Because I'll, I'll, I'll seed it a little sure. bit. The ABC some years ago started a program called Australian Story. Um, and more recently, well, actually quite a while back, the Conversation Hour, uh, and I think Trent's feature pieces are in a similar vein where the aim is to sort of let the story unfold in the voice of the, of the subject. So it's not so much the journalist reporting, he said this, but go for it, oh, Trent. That's a great point, Steve. I mean, and thanks for bringing that up. That's exactly, I guess, my approach. Take yourself out of it and let the person tell that story. That's, that's one way you can make sure you know that that... You know, I used to write a column called Ordinary People and, uh, and it was just in their voice and it was just the most wonderful thing. I get to go out there and, and they would tell their story and, and everyone would know that it hasn't, there's nothing, there's nothing that can be done with it. It's just their voice and it's just verbatim. And uh, I did this thing where I set up a table in King George Square and I, and I had a sign up on the table and I used to just sit there like writing and the story was written by the person and I had on the sign open to discussion and it was just like they come up and they just spurt stuff at me. Call me an arsehole, call me whatever you want, and I'll write it. You know? So and they know you will. Sorry. No, 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 sorry. <laughs> sorry, I probably sorry, wasn't meant to say. <laughs> but um, but uh, it's such a good point. You know, there's this great um, um, app 
in America called uh, Longform, and it collates all of the articles that they consider wonderful, and they they put it out to the reader, and you can you can you know subscribe to this app, and you know that it's been vetted and and it's been sort of glorified by an editor. You know, I, I think I'd love to see that sort of like a like a crikey for like celebrating good journalism. Now, <laughs> a- Andrew, know, crikey style is slightly different, isn't it? Because you, you almost, there was sometimes like the comment and facts in the in the crikey pieces, and Green Left is different again. It's activist journalism, isn't it? Uh, Andrew. Oh, look, I mean, I think the trend in crikey is probably as guilty as any other outlet. The, the trend is towards a more personalised sort of news source, uh, you know, b- uh, bylines. I mean, I, I, The Economist is probably the only sort of publication that doesn't, ha- still doesn't have bylines. You know, at once upon a time, the, your bylines weren't even a thing. Um, but, I mean, journalists now are being um, encouraged to, to tweet. They're encouraged to... R- the, the ones I love the most are the ones where they run their little comment piece next to their supposedly objective hard news story, right <laughs> next to it, you know, this is what I really think about this issue. Yeah. Or they wait for an inquirer on the weekend to, to, to sort of, like, to, to, sink the, to sink the knife in. So um, I think that... I mean, I, I agree with Trent. I think we need to get back to the sort of things you were sort of talking about. They're, th- they're three distinctly different styles, though, aren't they, from, from news in the Wicked magazine to crikey style to you and to Green Left Weekly, which is very activist. You know, you're, you're deliberately inserting yourself and a worldview to compensate for what you see as the inadequacies of other media. Well, yes, I, I, I don't think anyone reading Green Left will be able to say this article is completely without opinion. Um, and, and, and that's quite open and clear. But what they will be able to say is that this article contains... A, 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 enough references and facts and figures that I can then go and uh, confirm uh, uh, and tells a, a much b- bigger story. Uh, and I guess uh, the beauty of not having advertising means we, we can fill entire pages with stories. But, um, yeah, I, I, I think still from, you know, serious mainstream newspapers, people expect news uh, to be news without opinion. Um, and I agree with Andrew, it's moving... Uh, away from that direction, the very opinionated sort of stuff you, you start seeing uh, here and there in, in, in major newspapers. Mm. Well, uh, it's, it's time to wrap it up. Uh, I do want to say that I hope you'll hang around because you might be able to get to talk to these guys directly. In my mind, how you know if you can trust the media is simple. Engage with them, talk with them, tell them what you think, give them a lead, give them a story and test them. See if you were treated fairly. Provide the material, you've heard where they are editorially and personally and ethically, and they'll all use phone tap material if need be, or voicemail material, under certain circumstances. So your choice is, do you or are you prepared to act on what you've heard from these journalists? Um, thank you very much for coming. I'll hand it back to, uh, to Anna Magnus or Ursula. Thank you. Would you please welcome our, thank you, thank our panel. Well, guys, that was fantastic. Um, we have a few little items for you all that we'll happily give you. Steve, I'm going to hand this to you. You might I have, have to declare this. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. I don't think it'll be that much. <laughs> Thank you, guys. Um, Thanks, everyone. Right. Thank guys, that was fantastic and, and really entertaining. Um, I... I like to keep going. Uh, So I'd like to thank you all for a fantastic discussion Um, and in a moment we'll have some light refreshments and a few nibbles and make it all very civilised. And so you can talk to our speakers if those that are going to stay around for a few moments. But just before you go, I just have to mention a couple of little Walkley events that we've got coming up that you might find interesting. We're delighted to tell you once again that, the, that Brisbane is going to be hosting the Walkley Awards uh, this year. Um, and uh, we'd like to thank the Queensland Government through Events Queensland for their ongoing support. We hope you'll join us at the gala event dinner um, on Thursday the 28th of November. Long way away, but still. Uh, to celebrate Australian journalism. Uh, the past few months have been a very busy time for the Walkley Foundation. A review of the Walkley Awards that we began last year is still ongoing. We have hun- received hundreds of submissions and are now going through the process of analysing those contributions to ensure that the Walkleys keep uh, pace with the changes taking place in the media industry. Steve, that's something perhaps you could um, contribute to. Um, <coughs> 
Uh, the Walkley Awards are the peak awards for excellence in Australian journalism and we want to make sure that they remain th the, that way. On May the 3rd, um, uh, the UNESCO World Press International Freedom Day will be honoured and we will host our annual Australian Press Freedom Media Dinner in Sydney with the Sydney Morning Herald investigative journalist Kate McClemont as our keynote speaker and Hugh Remington, the Canberra Bureau Chief for the 10 Network, as our Master of Ceremonies. The dinner will be the key fundraising event for 2013, raising valuable money for our Media Safety Solidarity Fund. Um, so tonight, um, oh, here we go, which helps to educate children in this slain journal and slain journalists in the Asia-Pacific region and assists with press freedom campaigns across the region. Also at the dinner, we release our annual report into the state of press freedom in Australia. It's always astonishing to, have, to read how the government and the law can spar to prevent scrutiny, as these fellows know. We would love to see Queensland represented at that event, so for details on how to book your seat to the dinner, please visit the Walkley's site at www.walkleys.com. In the meantime, we hope to see you all at the next month's media talk, which will be on March 27th on the topic of editorial pressures and spin city, um, how do journalists find the balance? Uh, we could just continue, because I'm sure all of these guys have a, an opinion on that as well. So without further ado, thank you very, very much for coming, for welcoming us once again. And we do hope that you'll continue to support these really important discussions and panels and keep journalism alive and well. Thank you.